So we're here to talk about your new album, A Kiss for the Whole World, right? I was listening to it yesterday a couple of times, and it's awesome. It's awesome. It's uh, what is what people is saying. It's like a mix of the old and then on the new, or the recent Enter Shikari, right? Okay. Yeah. 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 It's got. I mean, it feels like a a kind of natural progression, I suppose. Um, but at the same time, with, with the the context of everything that's been going on, it feels like a bit of a rebirth and a new start completely. So, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Okay, so first let's talk about the the full sleeve image that you well you published like a couple of days ago on your social media, and now finally we can see that actually the forest we see in the background is actually the forest from uh, a flash fruit of color right you can see even the triangle i think the image was uh, made by the, uh, one of your colleagues polygon and explain us more about what are the, the influences similarities or why is that forest on the background yeah so a flash fruit of color was possibly the first album where we really set out our view on the world you know i think Common Joes and Take to the Skies obviously had like social commentary and political commentary, but um, I think with Flash Flood Color, color the, the, the front cover was supposed to be very clearly um, our view on how the kind of structure of things needs to change from your, your traditional triangle structure with the, the few at the top get, getting all the wealth and all the power and then the many at the bottom um, just being sort of trodden on. Um, and used and abused and exploited uh, and of course with the triangle turned on its top so you have the the many at the top you know a, a sort of a true democracy if you like not what we have today um, and then a few at the bottom um, so that that was our idea of just like a, just the simple upturning of, of our structure yeah. uh, and then it feels like with this album there's been so many kind of attempts at progress um, you know whether whether we're talking about social structures or economics or with uh, kind of environmentalism and renewable energy all these ways that we're trying to progress but it's so difficult and as we keep coming up against so many barriers um, and so many and we keep having so many failures um, and so I thought it was important to make an album that was quite clearly about hope I think and and being feeling motivated and and feeling empowered um, so even though the the forest has burnt down and it, you know it feels like the world is a very dangerous very scary place at the moment the direction that we're going in is very frightening um, but there's always hope you know there's always ways that we can fight for a better world and that's what the fire lily represents so even in a burnt landscape these this fire lily which is this beautiful aspect of nature um the one we use was the the fire lily that's native to south uh, south africa when it, it begins to grow literally just a few days after a fire a forest fire has finished mm -hmm. the biology triggers the this flower to grow so there's always beauty there's always hope there's always um a sense of togetherness that that means that we can we can fight and we can change the world for the better exactly and actually it's a message that is much needed especially after the last three years that we face uh lockdown COVID, globally and not only that corruption poverty everything that is going on in the, on the world is quite easy to just feel let down depressed so a message like this is it's much needed you know yeah it, like sometimes that's you know that's all it takes like a kind of a boost you know um mm -hmm. i think it's very easy in this current environment to slip into nihilism um mm -hmm. just feeling that you're powerless um there's nothing's going to change you know so what's the point you might as well just look after yourself and just you know be self-interested which is exactly what the system wants. You know, the system mm -hmm. thrives on self-interest, on competition, on making us feel small and only individual. 
Whereas we know that our true power comes from when we come together and we're not self-interested, we're not individual. We're, we're, we're kind of human beings in the sense that how we, we always have been. We work in uh, groups, we work together. That's, that's the reason we survived on the savannas of Africa. It wasn't because we were the most fast species or the strongest or the most intelligent. It was because we worked well together. Um, and that's something that we're trying to constantly concentrate on with um, Enshikari. <coughs> no, excuse me. <coughs> no, no worries. Yeah, totally. And, you know, sounding wise, also, this album has uh, very interesting things. You know, I live in Spain, but I'm from Latin America, right? So when I heard, please set me on fire, those firm first minutes, I said, okay, this sounds familiar. This sounds like a Caribbean rhythm or I don't know if you know the, the genre of reggaeton, which is quite mm. famous. Yeah, it, sound, it sounds like, like the drums or something it sounds like this. So I don't know if uh, it was was intended or it was just uh, an accident. <laughs> yeah, no, our, our drummer Rob is always uh, being influenced by different styles of, of, of music from around the world. Um, yeah, and that, you know, there's, yes, as you say, like reggaeton or like dance hall, there's kind of that, that kind of um, ebb and flow, you know, that push and pull um, yeah. you get from that rhythm, which just makes it really interesting. Um, and it's something that we've always tried to do, you know, it's, we listen to such a broad range of music because um, I'm, I'm fascinated. I, I love to explore all different types of music. Um, and then it ends up being absorbed and it comes out in our in our music. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Um, and the videos were also really good, you know, especially it hurts. And But man, you are writing, producing, you're releasing the songs, you are mixing the songs, you are your own record label, um, you are preparing your live shows and now you are also producing the videos. <laughs> so it must be exhausting, right? So I assume that no one's better than you to do all these things for the band. Um, well, I mean, we have a team. It's yeah, it's not just it's not one hundred percent DIY. Um, yeah, I wanted to um, move into directing the videos because there's details within the music that are never conveyed in in our videos you know when you when you give it to another director they have their vision and then you know that can be great but i think with this album i really wanted to give directing a go because it just enables it enables you to visualize the songs in a way that you, that you would want to um and i've often never been really that happy with our music videos um so it was it was really nice experience to to give that a go oh great Right, and you know, the singles that you release, uh, we can feel them like uh, party songs or anthems, or they're, they get you in the mood, right? But there's other kind of songs also on the album, like Deadwood, you know? It's quite impressive, like the, those few minutes, it was only, I think it's cello or violin and just your voice, and especially the lyrics. The lyrics hit hard. Mm. So, um, In these kind of songs, do you see like a, an exercise of uh, just exercising your inner demons or something like that, especially in the lyrics? Yeah, I mean, well, all, all the songs are, are, are kind of influenced by experience. Um, I mean, that song is, is all about when you, when you kind of wish you could reciprocate someone's love, uh -huh. uh, but you don't feel like you, you can. Um, I think there's been lots of songs written from the point of view of someone who wants somebody, but they don't want them back, so the love isn't reciprocated. Um, whereas I thought it'd be quite interesting. Um, oh, I mean, I've, was, I've obviously experienced that, but I've also experienced um, the feeling of being with someone and realizing that y you don't feel the way that you should do about them, and you, you realize that, you, you, that the relationship isn't right. Um, so I thought it'd be interesting to write about it from that side of things. Um, I think most people have been on both sides uh, mm -hmm. um, at some point. So, so yeah, and it's it's a. I think often when you 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 hear music that's from that side, from where you say you're you're like in control, if you like, and you realize that you you 
you don't love this person or you don't have the feelings that you, you feel like you should often music is written and it's it's kind of petty and it's like you know i don't i don't care about this bitch and i'm better you know it's it's a bit yeah. weird um whereas i thought it would be kind of interesting to write about the experience of how painful it can be you know when you when you see that someone cares about you so much but you don't you know you care about them but you don't have the feelings of of love and and a drive and a you know whatever else for them it can be really upsetting so i thought that was uh, an interesting topic to to write about and th- th- my experience with that is that i i felt for a few years i felt like i wasn't sure whether i'd ever fall in love again and i wasn't sure whether i'd ever be in a relationship again because i just left a very long relationship mm-hmm. um, and so the yeah the lyrics in the the kind of big epic section at the end um uh, you know i wish i could feel the way you feel that, that was essentially what because i wanted to be in a a loving you know comforting relationship but i didn't feel like i i could be so yeah i just wanted to write something that was um encapsulated my experience good good you know people is uh, quite happy to listen to chris on the songs again you know he's getting more mm. vocal spots so yeah. how that came about Yeah, well, Chris has had some real difficulties with his his vocal cords over the years. Um, he's had difficulties with mainly with his hearing. Um, mm-hmm. with, he 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 gets like, yeah, he's had some issues. But anyway, he he's he's progressed a lot over the the last kind of two two years. Um, and it was it was a relief really because I you know I've, I've wanted him to have more vocal parts. For a while, but it feels like now he he probably is in a much better place, um, and he's able to perform them live and everything. And um, yeah, so so finally, there's some there's some good bits of, of Chris on the album. <laughs> great, great. Uh, you know, um, as we said before at the beginning of the interview, um, most of the comments on the videos of the singles is like oh i'm so happy this this synthesizers reminds me of all enter shikari and it's a mix like the old and the new so after listening to the whole album it's it's quite true actually you can you can have like both enter shikari's in one <laughs> in mm-hmm. one album so do you see it like this way as well i know i don't know if if you just before you enter to compose the album you say okay let's do like a mix let's get back this uh i don't know especially the vocal melodies and the synthesizers reminds you a lot of what you have done in the in your first albums you know yeah i don't think there was much there's never really much conscious um planning um with with the way i write i i i write very much from emotion and from you know what feels instinctual mm-hmm. um, and so yeah i i didn't I, the only thing i realized as i was writing was that the, the music all seemed quite excitable and quite positive and up tempo um and i think that was because i was just really excited to write music again because i went for a year and a half without writing any music over the pandemic um mm-hmm. and that was quite a you know it was a worrying time i i was like have i just lost the ability to write music um <laughs> but i think it was because we didn't we weren't playing shows and live music is like the fuel you know for me as a songwriter um the 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 feeling of human connection and the feeling of purpose um that's what i need i think to write music so when i started when we started playing shows again and i was like oh okay now i feel like i can write music again <laughs> And it was a relief. It was a big relief. So um, yeah, the music came out very energized. Um, but that was kind of all all I really knew. It's only um, it's only once you've made the music, then I can look back and go, oh, okay, that's interesting. That might be similar to this album or this song before. But yeah, right. And you know, you're playing on the on the Fortnite face uh, this year on the states. And I was watching the lineup, and it took me back like 20 years ago i see these bands and say okay I, these were the bands that i was listening to it like 20 years ago and i think recently uh take to the skies turned 16 i remember like yeah. two or three songs from that album were on my space before the album was released and we don't have my space now now it's it's quite a nostalgia trip right 
So do yeah. you see that as well? Like people just really want to get a grab of what was made like 20 years ago, and like people are in the 30s and the 40s want to see again the la the band they were just listening to it when they were in their 20s. Yeah, I think uh, f <laughs> there's lots of things I can think about this. I think <laughs> the, most, the most interesting um, thing is usually when society goes through a period of adversity now at the moment we have the economic crisis we have all sorts of other crises um often people want to escape yeah. and a a kind of secure way to escape is to escape into memories and nostalgia and so i think that's if you look back through history as well that that's often happened within art there's been a you know, d during periods of adversity, there's been the the art has sort of stagnated somewhat, um, and it's it's because people want to just relive their pure, you know, childhoods and their their the times when they were perhaps less stressed and less um, uh, fearful about the state of the world. Um, so it completely it makes sense, you know, that there's a lot of this <laughs> this feeling of, of of history and and nostalgia and looking back and and uh, reliving some of our earlier experiences. But yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm exactly the same as you, like just, yeah, looking at that lineup now, in fact, like, you know, b our day is just amazing. Like I, I'm going to see Gorilla Biscuits for the first time, you know, <laughs> that, 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 for me, that's just incredible. And Youth of Today, like these are some of my favorite hardcore bands ever. Um, Thursday are, are good friends of ours, so we're looking forward to catching up with them um, I've never seen Head Automatica I've never seen Turnstiles so even just our day is brilliant and the other days the, the uh, lineups look great great well Ru we are running out of time okay so just one last question um, talking about live shows and going on tour there are a lot of bands that are touring Europe especially Europe um, they are complaining actually they are stopped selling merch at the venues because they are complaining that the venues are charging like a 20% fee from sales and plus bad on that. And I know that bands that are touring London or Paris or the Netherlands, uh, they just decide that they're not gonna sell merch when they're on tour. And you know, uh, selling merch is, is, a, is a huge thing for a band touring. Yeah. So what are your thoughts about it? I don't know. Um, are the venues doing something they shouldn't? Uh, is like this is how the industry works um yeah no i i think it's pretty ridiculous that they they charge so much for merch um you know i think the only rational or moral way would be for, for to, to dramatically reduce that charge or to give bands a certain amount of the money made from the bar yeah you know, if you think about it, the, those people are only in that venue to see that band. They wouldn't be buying the drinks at the bar if that band wasn't playing. So then that that, that makes just as much sense as the, as the venue taking a cut of the merchandise. Um, but yeah, it's really frustrating, especially for smaller bands, because people think that the main way bands make money is from touring. And that's true if you're if it's your tour, if you're the headline band. But if you're a support band, you're not making much money. You know, you get a fee, but it's not that much. So you're surviving through your merch sales. Um, and so for then for, you know, the venue, especially the bigger venues, like if it's arenas or, you know, large halls, um, for them to then say that, oh, we need to take a 20, sometimes 30% cut, um, and we're going to give you our merchandise seller and you you can't use yours so the band is having to pay their merchandise seller for essentially a day off um and then they have to use the venue's merchandise seller who probably isn't as good he doesn't know the merch as well he doesn't probably doesn't speak to the fans how you would want your merchandise person to speak to them um so yeah it's it's just the whole thing's really frustrating and i hope it um i hope we see some change in that respect Hopefully, hopefully.